Okay, so welcome everyone to the Applied Topology Network seminar. The speaker today is Bei Wang, and she will tell us about Topo Act, visually exploring the shape of activations in deep learning. All right, should I get started? Yes. All right, everyone, thank you for joining the online meeting and hope everybody is doing well, given the current situation. Uh, so this is an interesting project that I did with my students. Um, it's called Topo Act because, you know, uh, it's topology together with activations uh, in deep learning. Uh, this is my attempt to try to bring some TDA into machine learning. Uh, there has been a lot of work in this domain recently, and it's quite exciting. Um, so, um, so the first of the first two authors I want to note from um, Achit and Nissing, they both um, contribute equally to this work. Um, the paper is on archive, and then the most exciting part is that we also have demo as well as a source code that is publicly uh, available. And then if I have time towards the end, I'll give a demo. All right. So, okay. So uh, you know this project started uh, because. Um, because actually of a tweet uh, by a guy, um, Chris Olaf um, from uh, Google Brain. Um, and, uh, you know, so I would like to acknowledge uh, his uh, Twitter message and it's also shared by Jeff Phillips. And also I would like to acknowledge um, my funding agencies, um, uh, NSF. And then of course, here are my wonderful co-authors and my students. Uh, First one is Achit, second one is Nissin. Nissin is actually an undergrad, um, and the third one is Sara. All right, so what do I mean by this is a, tw this is a project that starts with Twitter? Uh, so at some point, uh, Chris Olaf, who works at uh, visualization for uh, sort of deep learning, uh, posted a Twitter message back in 2019. What they did is they take the activation vectors, which I will explain playing soon, what they mean, they take activation vectors from uh, deep learning models, and then they project it onto two dimensional domain, and then they get a picture uh, looks like the picture on the left. Um, and then, and then he said, well, if you look closely uh, at this activation, uh, what they call atlas, which is basically the projection of those images based on their um, based on their activation vectors, and you say you see something interesting like loops. Uh, for example, you go around, you see images that is coming from underwater, surface of water, fountain, cloud, sky, sky, and underwater again. And then, and then he said, well, here's another one, you know, kind of loopy structure that ground, grass, leaves, flower, feather, birds, and so on. Okay. So, so he, and then he said, well, one would argue that for those loops that could be, uh, you know, real topological features and so on and so forth. And, uh, and the next one would be say, well, you know, I would wish someone would apply TDA to neural network representation and TDA seems like to work much better on nice learned representations. So this is really just the start of our project. You know, I look at this and Jeff forwarded this tweet to me and I'll be like, yeah, it would be an interesting uh, student project. Let's give it a try. So here's a paper. Um, so what we want to do is apply topological data analysis for neural network representation. So uh, what are the questions we are facing, really? Um, first of all, what is a main challenge in deep learning? Uh, I'm, I'm not claiming I'm going to be able to solve this problem, but those are interesting questions in deep learning. Uh, essentially, what representations have those neural networks learned that could be made humanly uh, interpretable? Right? So given a trained neural network, what we want to do is we want to probe the neural activations, uh, which is combination of neural firings. Uh, in response to a particular input image. And then if we have millions of input images, then what we would like to do is to obtain a global view of what the neurons have learned by studying the neural activations at a particular layer and as well as across multiple layers of the neural network. Oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime. So, so we essentially are interested in three questions. They are all related which is number one, what is the shape of the space of activations? Number two, what is the organizational principle behind the neural activations? You know, and how are those activations related within a layer and across layers? 
So this is what I consider an interesting application of TDA uh, in study the space of neural activations. And we obviously have uh, quite a bit of ingredients in here, and I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, some of them are going to look very familiar for, for some of the audience. The ingredients include, well, we're going to map the neural activation vectors as point clouds. And number two, we're going to use things like mapper graphs as a summary graphs of those uh, activation vectors. And number three is uh, what's called feature visualization. It's just a way to try to reverse engineer. This is an existing technique to try to reverse engineer from some activation vector to an image that might lead to that activation. And finally, we have the tool to do interactive and exploratory visual analytics. So uh, the tool is where I could do the demo as well. Okay, so um, from the top down, really what we are after is you know what what is the organizational principle behind neural activations and we feel that mapper graph is a good topological tool to try to capture that of course by nature of the mapper graph there are two type of topological structure we are really after one is a branching structure and one is a loopy structure as you see the twitter message is mostly focused on sort of loopy structure but it turns out for us there's quite a bit of branching structures that is actually very humanly interpretable all right hey, so, hey let me give you let me interrupt just to give you a chance to comment on the discussion that's going on so oleg asks did the visualization with loops in the Twitter data take into account the data's density? Um, there were images inside the loop with smaller size. Does that mean the, re the region is of lower density? And then your yeah. co-author, Archit, responds, yes, uh, the size of the thumbnails was propor proportional to the number of activation vectors. And then Oleg says, so if not accounted for density, there would not be a loop, right? Um, so, so, so part of this, what we want to uh, account for density is things like JCAR index. Uh, so between edges on the mapper graph, we impose on JCAR index on it. So that's account for the size of the cluster and um, how much they overlap. So that's one way to do it. Of course, that's not a unique way to do it, but that's how we did it. Thanks. Okay, all right. So yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't keep track of the chat history. So yeah, just remind me if there's questions there. All right, so what is the take home message, right? You know, if you're gonna to go to sleep, um, you, know, you know, two minutes from now, this is really the take home message. Really, we have this tool where you can explore a pre-trained neural network. Um, and underneath it uses mapper graph to capture the underlying topological structures, specifically branching and looping structure uh, in the space of neural activations. And uh, what we argue is that those sort of structure are hard to detect if you just apply traditional dimensionality reduction techniques. Um, and we think that this kind of view will offer new perspective on how a neural network sees the input image. Okay, and this is the interface of our tool. Okay, so uh, here is my very brief high level um, uh, overview of uh, you know, the particular um, deep learning model we used. Um, I don't claim to be an expert working in deep learning field, but uh, you know, I learn as I go. And uh, you know, feel free to ask questions. And if there's more detailed question over you know, Inception V1's architecture, I can also redirect a question to Achit, who appeared to be online. So he can also say more about specific architecture uh, behind this uh, Google Net. So Google Net is also called Inception V1. Um, it's, um, here is an overview of uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the network itself. You know, there is multiple layers across and each layer is a CNN um, by itself. But what we do is we focus on uh, within this neural network, uh, let's see, total of nine uh, layers. Um, and what we do is we collect the activation of neurons for each of those layer. Okay. So, well, this is again my one page introduction of what is a neural activation. So imagine I trained a neural network, neural network model. So what we work with is a pre-trained model and we focus on a particular layer of interest. And now giving this trained model, I can uh, put in through an input image. So when an input image goes into a pre-trained model, the, uh, we can collect what we call activations. 
What is activation? Activation is essentially the numerical values of how much each neuron has fired with respect to the input. In some sense, you know, if this is artificial neural network, this is to say, how does my neural network react to a new input? And, and then the activation of a neuron is essentially a linear, a long linear transformation of, or you know, in other words, a function of its input. So what happened is in this case, a single neuron will produce a collection of activations from a number of overlapping patches of an input image. So whenever you have an input image, actually um, what you break down is that input image is break down into multiple overlapping uh, patches of smaller sizes. And for each of those patch, a neuron is going to give you a uh, sort of think about it as a real value, uh, which is how much they have fired with respect to this patch. And what we did actually in this case, we just randomly sampled a single activation from those patches. So of course, here's might be a question, right? In some sense, the activation vector we use in this study is just a random sample of activations with respect to a patch from an image. Potentially, you can say, well, can I have a better way of selecting those patches? For example, if I have an image that includes sky, including a dog, including grass, you know, depends on where I sample, I may or may not, you know, kind of really capture what's in there. So there might be a lot of room for growth here. But here, what we argue is that, you know, since we are taking a random patch and we have a huge amount of data that fit into the a neural network that the activation vectors is still a good representation of sort of the population of images, even if we're taking um, sort of random patches. Okay, so, so a high level picture is a neural activation is essentially how a neural react to a patch sampled randomly from an input image. And it's a high dimensional vector. For example, you know, in this case, there is a patch of, a, you know, from the picture of a dog surrounding his eye, there is a patch surrounding a patch next to the cat, but not really on the cat. And then what I showed here is the activation vector of a particular neuron with respect to that patch. And those are the vectors that form our point cloud. Okay, so that's what I call neural activation. It's a bunch of high dimensional uh, vectors of a single neuron react to a single patch of an input image. So you're using the activation, the weights to form the point cloud? Yes. Okay, did you use yeah. any convolutional nets or is everything just straight oh. nets? So actually, so in Inception V1, each layer by itself is already a convolutional neural network. Okay, Thank Yeah. You. Yeah, there's other ways to, of course, form your point cloud. And, you know, in here, we want to focus on activation vectors. I think that if there's other ways to form high dimensional point cloud from a neural network, this whole framework still is applicable, except that you are looking at essentially the shape of a space of a different nature. So here we mostly focus on activation vectors, right? So, you know, in some sense, the interpretation, at least my interpretation of neural activations is how a neural network react to a particular input, right? It's, it's, this vector is in some sense representing how the artificial neuron is firing when they see this patch. Okay, so, um, all right, so here is a little bit more detail. Suppose, uh, suppose if each of the input image we put in has 14 by 14 patches. They are partially overlapping patches. And uh, let's say if I focus on layer 4C, and um, it's, it means that each of those patch uh, is going to, uh, each of those patch is going to give me uh, uh, activation, okay? And then I'm going to only sample one of them. And each activation vector then is now a high dimensional uh, vector and its dimension depends on the number of neurons, right? So if, for example, uh, at layer 3A, there is 256 neurons, so all the point cloud from that layer is 256 dimension. You know, layer 4A has 512 neurons, so the corresponding point cloud is 512 dimension. And what we did, um, this is largely uh, due to our limitation of timing. We basically have a pre-trained Inception V1 neural network, which is trained over 1 million images. Uh, for us to explore the space of activations, we, uh, we provided an input of 300K images. So basically for each layer we are seeing, we have 300K points in that point cloud of varying dimensions across layers. 
And then we apply the mapper framework to obtain the summary of those point clouds. All right, so I give this talk to a general audience. <laughs> so, so this is a bit of math that is introducing a, a mapper graph. But I think for this audience, it, I should replace this picture with something very pleasant and very happy versus, you know, uh, the screen. All right, so here is a picture, right? Um, there are two topological constructs. Um, that we uh, we care about. One is a continuous version, which is called a rib graph. The other one is the discrete version, in a sense, which is what we call mapper graph. So the rib graph, um, you know, on the left hand side, if I have a topological space, in this case, a torus, um, that is coupled with a function. In this case, the function is a height function. Then what I consider as my data is the underlying topological space x coupled with a function f. Then the rib graph, which I use R, represents the connected components of a level set of this function for a cross all range of level set values. So for example, in this case on the left, I have the torus coupled with a height function. Um, if I have a uh, pick up a level set value A, then I look at the inverse of um, F inverse A and look at how many connected components are there. There are two in this case because there's two loops and then each of those connected components shrink to a point in my rib graph. So in another way, rib graph is considered as a skeleton of my underlying space. Okay, so this is quite familiar with some of those audience here, but you know, if it's confusing, just uh, feel free to ask any questions. So anyway, so rib graph is sort of, you know, you have a topological space equipped with a function, you obtain the behavior of these connected components at this level set. So it became a skeleton um, of this data. And then the next construct is what we call a mapper graph, is um, you know, in a way of uh, approximation of the underlying rib, rib graph. So, um, so instead of looking at the level set behavior uh, at a fixed value, you look at the behavior of the space under a particular interval. So what you start, of course, this is a simple version of a mapper graph where we're dealing with just a scalar function. So what we start with, again, we have a torus, we have a height function on it. The second picture here is essentially uh, the rib graph. But now instead of looking at a fixed level set value, I'm going to look at a cover of the real line by three intervals. So I have two red interval and a green interval. And then those interval have some overlapping uh, properties. And then this is what we call a good cover. So the definition of a good cover is a bunch of intervals so that the union uh, covers the range of the function and then the intersection of those covers are contractible. But you know, in this case, let's just say, you know, on the real line, I have three cover elements. And for each of the cover element, again, I'm gonna look at the inverse image of this cover element. So this cover element now is an interval. I look at the inverse map of this interval and look at how many connected components are there in my domain. So for the red interval, both of the red interval, if you look at the inverse map, there's two connected components. For the green um, uh, interval, the inverse map has two, uh, uh, sorry, the red interval, the inverse map has one connect component, the green interval inverse map has two connect components. And also because those connect components has overlap, then there's an edge between those intervals. So this is what you get on the very right hand side. This is what we call the mapper construction of the data. So if you provide a good cover of the range of the function, I can obtain, again, a skeleton representation of my data with respect to this cover. All right, so there has been a lot of theoretical work that studied the relation between the mapper graph and the rib graph. And there's many different versions of showing that under certain sampling conditions, certain condition over the cover, um, there is a convergence behavior between uh, uh, rib graph and uh, mapper graph. In a sense that mapper graph is an approximation of the rib graph and as my interval goes to, uh, you know, my number of interval goes to infinity, the size of inter interval approaches zero, those two things are going to approach in ver various distance measures. Okay, so a uh, high level, the mapper graph is an approximation of the rib graph. Uh, so, Bay, just one question. Uh, yes. So, uh, do you really need the cover of f of x to be good in order to get a mapper graph? So, like, that's from Mikhail. Ah, that's a very good question. Um, so, I actually, um, 
I just think it can be relaxed. It's actually, I think it still remains open. Maybe somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I think Primoz had uh, something related to approximate nerves and then okay. maybe addressing some of those issues. But yes, uh, but I think it's easier to make that such a good cover assumption for some of those surgical results to go through. But like I said, uh, pretty, much, pretty much approximate nerve thing also said that you can also relax in certain conditions. Hopefully I didn't misrepresent his work, but at least I think the first reference come to my mind is this approximate nerve lemma uh, that, you know, maybe a good starting point. Yeah, thank you. Oh, and also, I think recently we had a paper on uh, sort of approximate mapper graphs that uh, that has some more relaxed conditions as well. Um, this is called sort of a probabilistic mapper graph, and it's on my web page. So, all right, here here is another aspect of a mapper graph because I'm choosing some cover. That means that depend on the resolution of my cover, which means in this case, number of cover elements. I'm right now. I'm assuming all my cover elements are actually of the same size, but you know, of course uh, you can also uh, choose different sizes. In fact, in our paper itself, we also discuss about adaptive cover, meaning that the cover element kind of scale with respect to distributions. But in this case, I'm just assuming that the size of the cover is the same and then we're just varying the number of covers. So, so if I choose um, just two cover elements, in this case, two intervals that has partial overlap, then, uh, you know, in the middle, I see a mapper graph that is just a line. So what happened in this case is that my resolution uh, is too coarse. Uh, my cover is too coarse in a sense that I'm no longer covering the loopy structure of my underlying space. And of course, on the right hand side, this is my initial cover. Um, and you can imagine that I can increase number of covers and I'm getting finer and finer representation of uh, the underlying topology. Okay, so that's another aspect. Bay, so, yes. we have another question in the chat window. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, so with regards to the exact meaning of activation in the context of the first layer, um, is what you are calling activation here the result of a single weighted sum of a portion of the image where the weights are given by the kernel? Uh, what do you mean by kernel? So here, here is, um, so, so, that's convolutional easy. kernel oh so yeah so so to be a little bit careful that each of the we're treating in this model each uh, for inception v1 each layer by itself is a convolutional neural network so within each layer there is actually uh what we call layer there's actually inside that there's multiple layers too so so what we kind of treated is we're treating this layer as a sort of a single unit, um, and then we are only looking at sort of all the neurons, you know, in this entire layer, uh, what is the corresponding uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, firing rate, which is sort of uh, the, 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 the weight associated with this neuron when input comes. So yes, on the high level, you can think about this as a weight attached to a particular input uh, function. Uh, but to be clear that each of the layer of what we talk about here is actually uh, by itself a convolutional neural network. Um, okay, and then there is a, typically one has several kernels per layer, say n kernels per layer. If you have L layers, do you have NL activations? Is that correct? Okay. So, so, so I, as I warned you before, um, I would defer this question to Achit if he's there. So he can talk about the internal workings of this. Uh, uh, yeah, no problem. Of this thing. Um, and I hope, hope, hope Achit is listening and hopefully he will provide this inner working of this. Yeah, he's, he's on it in the chat window. Yeah, he's answering questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Of course, there's mapper, you know, so, so in some sense, let me just rehearse this part on mapper graphs. There's usually two parameters, if I'm assuming universal sized cover, which is number of cover elements versus amount of overlap, right? So for example, in this case, roughly each of those cover elements uh, for the picture on the right, they overlap, you know, a little bit less than 50%, right? That's another parameter. So of course, Mapper have tons of applications. This is just one of those earlier applications. It's actually coming from the original paper, I believe. Uh, it's it's 
you know, it can be used to extract skeleton, it can be used to study, uh, you know, cancer, you know, breast cancer, and so on, you know, the, the application is countless. Um, I'm just giving one example here. For example, here is using the mapper graph to extract the skeleton of um, elephant as even if elephant is, is doing different posture, that the mapper graph is actually invariant to the different posture of the elephant. All right, so of course, in practice, how is mapper graph used is that the underlying space is not replaced by a point cloud, right? So it's a point cloud sample some, of some unknown space. So again, I'm going to do the same thing. I have the point cloud sample. I, in this case, again, I'm choosing three cover elements. Um, and instead of, in the past, I'm looking at the inverse image of each interval where I'm looking at the connected components. In here, connected components is replaced by clusters. So, you know, so in this case, I'm looking at, say, the inverse map of the red interval. I'm looking at how many clusters are there. So here brings next question. What clustering algorithm do we, do we need to use? In practice, you can use quite a bit of different clustering algorithms. You can use things like, you know, k-means algorithm, but then you have to provide k. Uh, you can use sort of db scan, which is actually what we use, which is a clustering algorithm that is based on density. Okay. So in this case, this is another place where density does come into play indirectly uh, when you are actually computing clusters. So uh, this is sort of in addition to the previous question, where does density come in? So when you actually look at the red interval, you look at the in, uh, inverse of the red interval, there's one cluster if you apply things like db scan. Uh, and you look at the yellow interval inverse, there's two clusters of points. There's two, there's, for there's two points from the mapper graph and so on and so forth. Um, you know, if you look at the picture on the right, this is really a more detailed picture of the inverse image from each interval. And again, uh, there is a connection between two clusters. So now each cluster is represented by a node in my mapper graph. And then there is overlap. Uh, if, the, if the clusters have overlap, there's edge between them. So again, if, even if I replace my underlying space by a point cloud, I can actually, again, also apply mapper uh, construction to obtain a skeleton representation, uh, which is a picture in the middle. And again, it captures sort of the loopy structure from the underlying um, point cloud. So now if you imagine my underlying point cloud is, you know, let's say it's 4C, what, or 4A, it's 512 dimensional, and I can still apply the mapper construct and capture essentially its underlying topological structures applying this. Of course, in practice, there is this question, what parameter do we choose? What's, what is the number of intervals? How much overlap do we have? Do we need to use? And so on and so forth. So we don't you know, miss structures. Okay, so that is the bit over the massy part. And the last bit, again, you know, this is something that has already been developed in the past, and I'm just going to you know, talk about this in high level, um, you know, think about the following. If I have a bunch of activations, uh, what, what is sort of feature visualization is that, you know, we want to generate essentially a sort of a fake image uh, that roughly uh, give out the activations of, you know, the activation vector. So it's sort of like, uh, optim they go through a bunch of, um, 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 uh, optimization process to try to sort of, you know, if I have a bunch of activations, I kind of take the average of those activation vectors and I e reverse engineer a image that sort of visualize the type of features those activations are trying to capture. The end result is something a bit uh, futuristic. Uh, for example, in the middle column that the, uh, you know, activations are responding to the face of the dog and then the feature visualization of all these activation vectors uh, become this sort of futuristic image that roughly you can still see some sort of, you know, eye and nose features uh, from those original images that provide those activation um, uh, activation vectors. So again, I put provided some references there that talks about this particular visualization uh, techniques. Uh, so in our framework, we incorporate this to try to give you a sort of a global view of the group of activations, what is the type of feature they're roughly after. Okay. 
All right, so so here's some results, right? So um, and then later on, after you know, after I'm done with the talking part, I'm going to do the demo part. Um, this is uh, this is in the space of activations that you know, this is uh, the type of branching structure or what we call bifurcations you see in a particular layer. This layer is layer four C of the activation uh, of, of the of the neural network, and this is a branching structure um, that we see. The left branch, what we call a branch, is very much focused on the leg of the animal. So if you actually go to, so each of those image here corresponding to a cluster of activations. We just picked one, uh, the picture there is actually the feature activation. And then, uh, so in A, that is a feature activation which highlight that most of the activations is respect to the leg of an animal. But in, if you click on that cluster, we show a few sample images that give rise to those activations. And those are essentially um, animals with legs, for example, uh, horse and dogs. And then other branch, which is uh, you know, starting from D, and then it's a branch C and, uh, C and B, where C and uh, B and D, those are different sort of cluster of activations. So let's start with the branching node. In branch node D, what's interesting is that the images that give rise to those activations is a mixture of leg and body-like features. And it's so broad in a sense that you can see essentially the leg of animals, but also you see the whole torso of humans as well with legs. And, and, and now as you branch out towards the top on the right branch, you start seeing more and more just human images. And as you move towards the tip of the branch, you are morphing more towards from the whole torso of the human um, uh, towards sort of the face of the human. Right. So in a sense that, you know, if you think about what's in common between human images and animal images is that, you know, when they are sort of merging, you know, reverse of the branching, when they start merging, they have shared features in terms of legs and, and torsos. But then when they diverge far apart, you know, the humans start to be more into sort of face and so on and so forth. So we call this leg face bifurcation sort of is in some sense, the neural network is, uh, you know, sort of how, uh, recognizing uh, similar features between human images and animal images in term, term of the leg features. So that's one. Um, but of course, and, and ben, know, let me let me interrupt. So Ira asks, where's the where does the branching come from? This comes from the clustering and the mapper that you're doing. Yes, about. yes. The, what you see in the middle is a mapper graph. We just zoom into one part of the mapper graph and we focus on this particular branch. Right. There's many other branches you can play with. We just give you some examples of what you can see in this space. Our interactive tool allows you to explore all the branches, all the loops, and so on and so forth across different layers and also across different parameter combinations. Thanks. Okay. So, of course, one of the questions going back is to say, what's the difference really between the mapper graph and classic dimensionality reduction techniques? So in the tool itself, we also provide comparison between uh, sort of the mapper picture view, which is on the right, and on the left, this is a TSNI projection of the high dimensional point cloud. And what we have circled is this particular branching structure we just focused on. We highlight the corresponding activation vectors and look at how they are distributed in the TSNI projection on the left. So all the orange point on the left are the activation vectors if you were projected using TSNI. So what's happening is that essentially if you just apply traditional dimensionality reduction techniques to the activation vectors, you are not going to see those branching structures. That's really the main point here. Okay. So, but another question, you know, you know, is, is that, is, is this branching structure an illusion or it's actually something which we believe is really exists in this high dimensional space? So one way we want to compare against is also PCA. This is something we also think that it might be interesting and useful for more what we call refined analysis or maybe reanalysis of my activation vectors. So what happened is that we look at the mapper graph. We, we saw this particular branching structure. We can extract the activation vector that just belongs to those branching structures and just apply PCA to it. And in here, you see the, 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 the green point, oh, sorry, the blue point of the activation belongs to the leg branch. And then the red point are the activations that belongs to the face branch. So in a sense that when we actually just extract those activation pet, uh, vectors from our uh, topo act tool, then we can 
sort of using PCA, and then PCA is also a good indication that those are two separate distributions. I'm a little confused. So you're using activation function in two senses here, one for your mapper stuff and the other the activation function of the neural net, that exponential. Oh, yes. So, so, so totally independent. So, so let's be a, uh, let me be a little bit careful. What I call activation are the firing of the neurons. So, so if I have 512 neurons in that layer, I collected what is the firing or the weight attached to each of the neurons to a particular input image. That's, okay. And then together, that's a 512 dimensional vector with respect to a patch of an input image. That's what I call activation. Yes, I thank you for the question because I think there's a term called activation function from neural network that is confusing. What I mean activation vector is what I described. Okay. Yes. And here what you see is a PCA projection of activation vectors associated with that branch. And you can see even with PCA, you see that there's actually two separate distributions. Um, there's some overlap, of course, um, that's described why there is a bifurcation uh, precisely. Okay, next example, this is what we call a bird mammal. Hey, can I interrupt really quick? Yes. So Tamal Day asks, what was the function and cover used for the mapper construction? L2 nor. So we ah, I see, that was the function. Yes. Yes, that's another point of a discussion. There's many different, uh, you know, directions this project can go. Um, we choose L2 norm, and in fact, uh, I, I probably in the newer version of the archive update, we have a specific long discussion over what is the impact of using L2 norm. Uh, you know, it's it's not perfect, but it captures quite a bit uh, interesting aspect. You know, L2 norm of the activation vector kind of captures, you know, essentially magnitude of how the neurons are firing, like how excited they are as a group, you know, in some sense. Um, of course, you can use other uh, functions as well, and then you might see some other interesting uh, behaviors. Um, so, okay, so this is the second bifurcation example where the bifurcation, which we call bird and mammal bifurcation, if you start with a, with a point as uh, a cluster D, uh, it's, it's sort of, again, each of the image, the feature Dang. activation, yes. Uh, so the question is, how were the patches chosen? Is the same patch chosen across images? No, they are randomly sampled. Thanks. Yeah. We also thought about choosing the maximum or the minimum patches in terms of you know, the activations. And ultimately, it feels that it's reasonable to assume uh, using random, because if you choose, say, for example, the maximal patch, uh, you're sort of biasing your choice in certain way. So anyway, there, there's other ways of doing it. In fact, one thing we have discussed is instead of choosing a random patch, why don't we use all the patches? Why can't we just collect all the patches? It's very much just a um, time issue. <laughs> Since we have 300K images, our original plan was going to use like, you know, one or two million images inputs, and you take that times 14 by 14, uh, yeah, so you know we could bring this to the next level, uh, but it require uh, more computational power. Yeah. So okay. So this is a branch that you know if you follow the branch on the top branch uh, goes from cluster A, and then there's an example of cluster B. Again, each of the image there is a feature visualization that sort of try to represent what is a neuron C as a group in that cluster. Uh, but what you can see is that the top branch, if you look at the images that produce those of course there's noise as well but mostly they are coming from mammals and a lot of dogs because you know that's the nature of the training data set we have where there's a lot of you know sorry the, the data we fit into there's a significant portion of them are dogs um, the bottom branch is actually all birds right so 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 if you look at the bottom branch if you pick up one uh, cluster for example cluster e and cluster f and you look at the images that is sampled from the corresponding cluster, the, the images that give those activation vectors are mostly bird images. So uh, of course, this is, this is hopefully to help us interpret what is the neural networks doing. Our hypothesis is that, well, what's in common between dog and birds is that they are all furry animals. That's why somehow they were kind of merged together in this particular branch. There's also the geometry and text 
one, which is kind of interesting as well. Of course, you are going to see some noise in this case. Uh, you know, sometimes the animal picture will jump into there. But the branching, one of those branch, if you uh, follow, uh, you know, uh, you know, D, E, and, uh, and F, uh, the other branch, if you follow A, B, and C, this is what we call geometry text uh, bifurcation in a sense that, for example, if you look at the F cluster, even though the feature visualization is kind of futuristic, we don't know what it is, but if you look at each of the individual images, there are essentially things like menus. So there is actually text in those images versus the other one um, has more geometric information. So again, you know, for us to go back to the PCA, if you, if you take all those activation vectors from the mapper graph in the middle, I project it in PCA, the green, is, sorry, the red is one branch and then the blue is another branch. Okay. Um, so let's talk about loops because that's how we get started with this, right? So this is a particular loop that we call fur nose ear eye loop. This is a loop where if it goes around, it shows a bunch of animal pictures. But if you look at the feature, um, uh, feature visualization, it focuses on different parts of the animal. So there are some images that is mostly just fur. There's, some in, there's a cluster goes around. It's most likely it's surrounding the nose. And then there's a lot of pictures that is focused on the ear and then the eye. So this is really an interesting aspect of the loopy structure is to say, well, what the neural network is doing based on our interpretation is that, okay, it's going to re try to recognize certain animals, but it's going to have different parts of animals be recognized over this loop. The next one is what we call face body leg loop of birds. Again, it's a very similar philosophy. In the previous picture is different parts of the face. This picture is sort of, if you go along the cluster, each cluster contains bird pictures that corresponding to their face or the body or their leg. So again, you know, this is our conjecture is that it's trying to recognize again, different parts of the body of the animal. So this is a global picture, right? This is something, again, is, is, is very speculative, is that, okay, this is on, on layer 5B and is under certain parameter setting and is using adaptive cover, which means the cover size actually change. Oh, sorry, no, let me take it back. This doesn't mean a, a size change. Adaptive means that the size of my cover element is, or the number of cover element is chosen with respect to the density in a way. Uh, but what we see is that you see this sort of nice structure, sort of similar structure in the group of clusters in area A. There's a group of things in area B. It's sort of a very highly branched uh, areas of my mapper graph. And what we do is, uh, you know, we choose some of those examples that are coming out of those different branches. And what's really interesting is that there's actually similarities between the composition of those branching structures. They all have sort of a branch that corresponding to geometry in terms of square-like features. There's always a, bra the branch that corresponding to circular features. There's always a branch that corresponds to sort of like uh, line features. And then there's always a branch that corresponds to like a cylinder features. So we just thought this is actually fun to look at in terms of the overall distribution of those branching structures. And there is also some level of self similarities among them as well. Of course, nothing can be proved along these things. This is highly exploratory. Finally, uh, we haven't done much towards this direction, but the capabilities is already there. Since we have each layer has a summary graph, we can also compute the summary graph across different layer. What you see here is sort of three adjacent layers. So you can look at the sort of the mapper graph um, across different layers. And this is sort of, you know, going back to things like the Mati uh, multi-dimensional mapper like Tamal and Yusu's work, uh, they talk about sort of the persistence of, you know, mapper graphs across multiple uh, parameter settings. And this is sort of, you know, moving towards that direction of trying to visualize the mapper graph in adjacent layers. And then the hope is to understand how does the neural network progress across different layers. Okay, so demo. Uh, before I go do demo, I want to talk about sort of some questions, right? What is general, uh, you know, how can this be generalized? Can this, is this observation also applicable to other architecture? So I'm going to show you one other architecture, one other data set, you're going to observe similar behaviors. Parameter tuning, which is sort of like a real challenge for mapper graph. How do you really choose the number of intervals? I still think that this is, you know, outstanding question because 
there has been a recent work on statistical analysis, you know, of, of, of mappers and how to choose parameters. I still think there's a gap be between uh, theory and practice of how you choose them. Uh, scalability, stability, uh, and then, you know, L2 norm and adaptive cover. Here, when I say adaptive cover, I'm saying that the size of the cover element the size of the cover element changes with respect to the distribution of, 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 of the, of the uh, L2 norm. Um, that's what I mean. So just to show you, we also did this to a different network called ResNet, and we train it on a, uh, we, we, we actually have input images going in there for a smaller data set, um, which is called CIFAR uh, data set. And um, just to show you, you again see some branching. And uh, this is a very obvious branching that is, you know, humanly interpretable. It's a branching where one branch is horse and one branch is deer. Okay, they differ a little bit, but yes, this is a very easily interpretable branch. Uh, another branch, this is one branch is fog, frog, and one branch is cat. It feels sort of reasonable because, you know, as cats sit down or the frog, frog sit down, they have similar postures. They still, you know, they still have similar, I don't know, phases and so on and so forth. So this is, you know, uh, again, very easily interpretable branch. Oh, by the way, those images are lower resolution because, uh, you know, all our input image is 14 by 14. So they are all kind of blurry, but you can still see. And also they come with tags. You know, there are different type of cat and different kind of frogs. Um, the, this is a loop we see, again, you know, all our interpretation is humanly generated. This is a loop that involving sort of transportation, but of course, some, sometimes dog and horses were still coming. This is, this is a loop that involving airplane, sheep, uh, horse, dog, and truck. And again, you know, how do we interpret this loop? This is sort of up for debate. Um, so yeah, so let me just go ahead and do some demo. I'm going to share a different screen. Oh no, this one. Okay, so can people see the browser? Okay, yeah, we can. Yeah, so this is this is what I want to show. This is the this is the picture here. This this area, this is the branching I talked about before. This is the face leg branching. So if I click on this branch, it shows what well, this this turn out to be arguable whether how useful it is, it tells you the top three classes of things in there, but it's really mixed. Then, you know, it says, you know, six out of 380 images in here is tagged things like rugby ball, and the other one is Indian elephant, other, you know, is wig. So this is sort of less informative, but more informative is that if I click here on, on this area here on the right hand side, it shows what are the images in this cluster. So it's a sample of images in that cluster and then corresponding activation vectors of them. So again, this is what I see the, this is a leg branch. So again, this is a feature visualization of all the leg animals. Um, you know, and you can see there's many animals that have, you know, legs, mostly uh, dogs and horse and so on and so forth. And here, as I move away from here, I'm seeing more and more um, human images, but as I move along this branch, I start seeing uh, more images that involving less of a body, but more of a face, so, and so on and so forth, right? So um, again, what you see here, this is a global view of the activation, uh, uh, sorry, mapper graph of, of activation vector at layer 4C, uh, but of course, because mapper has multiple parameters, so we did a few combination parameters. What they say is overlap 20 means that it's 20% overlap over my intervals. Uh, epsilon fixed uh, is, uh, uh, actually epsilon here is, is the parameter used in DB scan uh, that is adaptive to uh, sort of the underlying cluster density. And, uh, and another thing you can do is you can also look at the corresponding TSNI projection of the point cloud in here, so you can have a comparison uh, between uh, what's in the mapper graph versus what's a corresponding TSNI projection. You also have UMAP projection as well, which is another dimensionality reduction techniques. Uh, you can turn this off. And uh, the what I showed in my result section is to say I want to show oh, I want to show activation images. When I show activation images, I replace each of the cluster by the corresponding feature visualization that represent roughly what is uh, what uh, each clusters of activations correspond to. Uh, I can switch between different layers. 
So this is, you know, remember we have uh, nine layers as well. Um, and, and one more thing we can do is you can also search for classes. For example, if I just want to say car, uh, no, I don't know, race car, it tells you where does the images of that tagged race car appear in my mapper graph. So there's a, a setting. And finally, this is something we haven't explored further is multi-layer exploration. So multi-layer exploration is to say that this is a three layer, the middle layer is 3B, where essentially I want to look at, you know, what, what is the relation between the mapper graph across layer. Hey, hey, sorry for the interruption. What does the thickness of an edge mean? Oh, thickness of an edge corresponding to the JCAR index. Okay. So in some sense that there is a larger, yeah, so there's a weight corresponding here. And let's see this one, this has a smaller weight. So it's corresponding to the weight of, uh, the, it's corresponding to the JCAR index. So how strongly are two clusters related to each other? Yeah. So again, you can click on a, uh, a layer and then you can look at the, the layer and this relation to adjacent layer. Again, you can also search for, I don't know, bear maybe, sloth bear, and it will show up which cluster across those layers, you know, that has contains this image or this particular tag of this. So this is sort of still sort of feature under development um, and that's that. So again, everything is um, open source and this, this, this tool is also deployed, so you can play with it. Uh, and, and if you go back to, if you go back to the landing page, you, you can go straight into multi-layer and uh, single-layer, multi-layer. There's a video demo, and finally, this is a lot other architecture that I mentioned before. The other architecture is ResNet is much simpler, so it only have five layers. But again, you can do the similar thing. In this case, we didn't include the activation, uh, sort of the feature visualization, uh, partially because it takes a while to pre-generate those feature uh, visualizations. But two is that we figure the actual images from each cluster is actually the most informative um, information. So again, you can do similar things. Uh, there's a bunch of parameter combinations you can play with. So that's that for the demo. Uh, I'm gonna start sharing and uh, I can go back to slides or I can just, you can just see my face where I can take some questions. Okay, yeah, we actually have two questions in the chat, but I've been deferring them so that I wouldn't interrupt okay. you all the time. Uh, so the first um, question is from Oleg, and um, he asked, haven't you observed that the topology of activation vectors simplifies in the deeper layers? Okay, so mm -hmm. now comes the part. So Krulkov of Sidivitz and Nizatlik Heng Lim uh, report that for unsupervised and supervised regime, uh, report that for unsupervised and supervised regimes respectively. Okay, so there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quite complicated question. Let me see if I, I, I understand it. The first You, you can try to open up the chat window as well, Bay. Okay. And, and you can read it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the topology of activation vector simplifies in the deeper mm -hmm. layers. Uh, we, we would like to see that, um, but actually I have, how would I say it? It, it? This is purely conjecture. I don't have proof that if you think about a neural network, eventually it's going to try to recognize things in more accurate way. That is actually, this question is one of our driving force why we did the multi-layer. So let me share the screen again. One of our driving force to do the multi-layer is essentially trying to understand what's really happening uh, in this. But if you look at this, my conjecture is actually the opposite in a way that there's more and more branching uh, as I go deeper. Uh, but again, this is a non-proven conjecture. Uh, I still think there's a lot to be done there. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know whether, whether the topology thing has become, actually, sorry, let's do this. Let's look at this piece here, this piece here, and this piece here. Actually, you're, in this case, hmm, the last three layer it does look like it became simpler, but it's very much a matter of what, again, all this is sharing the same set of parameters. So it's a question of whether our mapper graph should choose adaptive parameter across different layers, or it should choose shared parameter across layers, because the parameter also kind of influence how good 
your topology is, uh, you know, how refined your topology uh, summary is. So yeah, so I, I don't really know how to answer the, the first question. It's very much dependent on the parameter choice. But you know, on the first observation, it does look like the last three layers, the last layer became simpler uh, under the fixed parameter in this case. For example, it's, it looks more complicated, but I can actually simplify it in this case under this parameter setting. So, okay, so the second part of the question, let me see what can, uh, okay, so second part should say we intend to make the source, uh, da, 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 report that for unsupervised supervised regime respectively. So that I have no idea. I'm not, you know, I, I, I probably should read those references first. Uh, it would be nice if you could post the references there. So. I'm not familiar with those two references, so I, I'm not going to make any uh, <laughs> irresponsible res <laughs> response there. Okay, so, uh, ah, yeah, so the, you just put the references. Okay, cool. And then, uh, is there a map review for the entire neural network rather than layer wise? Um, that's present a question because remember each layer have different dimensions. Some layer is dimension of 512, some dimension, is some, some layer is of dimension, you know, in the 200s. It's a matter of how many neurons are in each dimension. So if I just naively combine those point clouds together, it's not clear what the global mapper graph will look like. Um, you know, ideally, if, if each layer have the same dimension, maybe it's fine, but there is also the question how meaningful it is to combine the activation vector across dimensions. So we have not tried it, partially because our activation vectors are of different dimensions. Okay, great. So do we have any other questions not in the chat window? Yeah, hi, Sarah, I have a question. Yeah. So I see this thing, the bifurcations, and it can look like this, it can look like this. This begs the question about adversarial learning, which is a huge problem in neural nets. How, how does your stuff relate to adversarial learning? So th th this question actually has came up before when I gave this talk first locally. Uh, so what we hope again, you know, this is me being very optimistic, is that you know if 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 I inject my input images, if I mix it with those adversarial images, right, like those stop sign with missing patches and so on and so forth, the question uh, that I think is very interesting is to say that does those adversarial images uh, falls into certain part of my underlying topology. It, do they do they actually belong to a particular branch uh, of my analysis, or are they mixed together with something else? Right. So in some sense, I mean that this at that one direction we're thinking is that you know if we actually have input images put into the pre-trained neural network where those input images are you know like I said uh, adversary adversarial in uh, in, in nature. Can we understand how they distribute across underlying topology? And if we know that distribution, can we figure out ways to um, to fix it? Or can we build into sort of robust way into my neural network so that we kind of can, can how to say, be more resistant to it? So yeah, so that's a very good question. And uh, I think at least I will say the starting point is to say if I, mixing input with adversary images uh, observe which you know what type of topology those adversary images form in the mapper graph that would be the first um, yeah yeah I, I think that would be the first thing I mean yeah. the worst case scenario is if those adversary images is still widely distributed across the different topological structure across different branches and so on and so forth uh, then yeah. So, so I, I actually think there's actually two types, right? At least, you know, I'm a naive understanding of how adversary images are. One is sort of universally cropped each pixel. So there's a perturbation over the pixels, but some of them is sort of like, there's a sort of patch, different patches. Again, in that case, if I want to do this more better, most likely we'll have to use activation vectors from all patches. So we don't yeah. the area where there's adversary attack. Um, and then the other version is that if there's, you know, universal, a noise, you know, perturbation for each pixel, then the random patch still work. Uh, but yeah, but I, I think just study 
what is the topological features, branching or circular, circular structure those adversary images actually introduce to the overall uh, mapograph will be a really interesting question. And the hope is that if they have observable, uh, observable behavior in terms of their distribution, maybe that will be a guideline to help build more robust neural networks. This is a big if. Yeah, but the whole field's a big if neural net. So this is a good yeah. approach. I think it's good. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Can I get, get a question in here? Um, so when you see the loops in there, do you think of those as bad that they're not, that those networks aren't working as well when you see the circles? Is a network with better performance tend to have fewer circles and more trees? Yeah, it's a, actually, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, one thing that we noticed, um, so the first time when we first started this project, we're, we're, our, our goal was, was very modest. We're, because because uh, uh, Chris, Chris had this tweet, and then he showed that when you actually project the activation vector, the, the, the sort of the loop structure you saw is a, in, the, in the projected space. So the first question is that, are those loops actually real? Is it just an artifact because of the projection? And it turns out actually a lot of those loops that he saw in the projected space, this is something we didn't put in the paper, but a lot of those loops he saw in the projected space, we couldn't find them in the mapper graph. But the ones we showed you are the ones that does show up in the mapper graph where we have some confidence they are actually truly loops in this high dimensional space. I wouldn't say whether it's undesirable because because, because as you can see that it, it, you know this loop ear this loop that involving ear eye and so on and so forth there are different parts of the animal that the neural network is trying to in some sense learn uh, to recognize that thing so at this stage I wouldn't say they are undesirable but if you just think about oh you know if classification is purely bifurcation then from that standpoint you know maybe I don't want loopy structures because the loop structure means that I'm not really classify things. Um, you know, so I, I don't yet have a good understanding whether it's truly undesirable, but you know, as example I showed you, I have some explanations why I see some loops. So yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good answer. So, so basically maybe you're saying that the, the loops are a feature of a data set being complex rather than of your network not classifying well. Uh, yeah, to be, to be clear, you also, you are going to see a lot of um, loops that is not meaningful, especially if some edges in that loop is very low weight. So some of those is also can be also an artifact of the parameter choice you have. Okay, you thank you. Imagine, beautiful, yeah. beautiful talk, thank you. Enjoy it. Yeah. Hi, Bay. Yes. Tamal here. Hi, Tamal. Nice, nice talk. I have one question. Uh, so as you go along the neural network layers, I, I expect that classification gets more prominent and your graph should be more simplified as somebody has already observed and ultimately it should be getting more components, getting disconnected. Uh, it also depends on your cover. Means yes. How do you choose your cover? Because if I choose my cover very coarse, I'll get more loopy structure. If I get, uh, so how did you choose the cover? That's my main question. What so, is the good choice? Yeah, so, so to be fair, our current work, <laughs> we did not really specifically tune those parameters very carefully. We just said, okay, let's, let's, let's guesstimate a reasonable parameter choice. I mean, actually, a lot of those parameter choices for this particular inception V1, we say, okay, let's start with 70. Actually, my student, uh, Nissing, started with 70. So I asked him, why do you choose 70? So it seems like 70 is a big enough number. <laughs> but actually, we started doing a little bit more, you know, following your question, how do we actually tune it? So I'm going to share, uh, this is not in my slides, but I'm going to share with you a sort of a distribution where we think that if we want to be more adaptive to, um, to uh, the underlying topology that we might want to, number one, the number of cover elements is going to be adaptive to the distribution you see over the uh, lens function or the scalar function we use. In here, we use L2 nor. So what you need to do is you plot the distribution of the L2 nor and kind of look at how complex that distribution is and then choose, you know, potentially your number of government adaptive to that complexity. Then specifically, for example, if, if you have very dense areas, then you want those dense areas to have smaller cover element uh, versus if you have very, uh, if you have area of the function distribution that is very flat, then you can have more longer uh, intervals. So that's sort of one of those guidelines. But I think theoretically, 
we are still kind of, this is an interesting theoretical question still to say, how do we actually make this very systematic? But I, what I want to show you is, uh, let me see if I can find it. So, okay. So I have another PDF I was gonna share. Sorry, I'm, I'm confusing myself which, which screen I'm gonna share, this one, okay. So in here, what we have is we plotted the distribution right here. So, so, so this is a distribution of L2 norm between activation vector and, uh, random, ve uh, uh, and random vectors across different layers. Um, actually, let me see. So yeah, so what we what we hope to do is to say we can use um, we can use the the distribution of of the scalar function on mapper graph to help us guide how we want to design the cover elements. For example, in areas here where there's a high peak over you know a lot. So if I use uniform cover element, I'm going to get a huge clusters. But instead, what we should do is do adaptive cover, meaning that the cover should be uh, sort of smaller and more refined versus in area like here where we don't need, you know, small cover elements. So yeah, so those are just some guidelines we try to use, but overall, I still think the theoretical problem remains open of how to choose uh, things, how to choose the right parameter combination for the mapper graph. Um, but what we show in this work is that even if we are not so careful about the, uh, the choice, we're still seeing interesting branching and, uh, and the loopy structures that are humanly interpretable. Thank okay, you. so uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so just um, for the sake of uh, having opportunities to thank Babe before everybody disappears, um, I would like, uh, so I would suggest that we finish the recording now, that you unmute yourself and we thank Bay again for her wonderful talk and a lively discussion. Uh, and um, um, feel free to continue asking questions once we finish the recording. All right, thank you everyone. Nice Thanks, Ray. Nice